Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Damcasters. And thank you so much for your patience for being off for a couple of weeks. But we've been doing work, well, for one of the weeks. Half the week, we were hiking in the hills of Sedona. The first week, though, we were back at the fabulous Pima Air and Space Museum. Now, I've got a lot to tell you and an excellent episode coming up. But first, we've got to do the sponsor thing, of course, the fabulous Pima Air and Space Museum, but also the equally fab 909 Apparel, who you'll be seeing me wear through this entire episode. If you've seen me in the real world, you will know that I love a great aviation-themed t-shirt and hoodie. Yet finding decent quality ones has been more of a difficult process than I would have hoped for. That is, of course, until I found the Fab 909 Apparel. Named after the famed B-17 Flying Fortress, which flew 140 missions without losing a crew member, 909 Apparel's designs celebrate the history and heritage of aviation, which is something I can totally get behind. Each design can take up to three months of research to complete so that you know that your passion for aviation is matched by the team at 909. And the great thing is you can get your 909 apparel, t-shirt or hoodie, just about wherever you are watching this, all through their Amazon shops. So do check out their link tree below to find your local store and get your aviation on. And yes, they do Spitfire ones as well. Check out the link in the description below. Now, it was great to get back to the Pima Air and Space Museum and spend more time with the team there. Now, one of the things I didn't get a chance to do when I was there last year was record with the director of collections, especially in their archive out the back with all their small items and basically things that aren't aeroplanes. Now, this is really cool. We look at some amazing stuff. You're going to love it, I hope. But it opens with a bit of a clangor because I've been getting his name wrong for 30 episodes. When we introduce Andy, the director of collections, I've been saying Bowley. It's not his name. Uh. I'll do the usual name, name, rank, serial number. Okay. So, Andrew Bowley, director Actually, of it's technically pronounced more Bailey than Bowley. Bailey? Yes. To all these years on the podcast, I've been saying it. It's all right. You recorded it. Well, it's fine. It's fine. I'm changing it anyways. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Oh, because I, I, it was one of those things where it's like, eh, it's okay. You know, but technically, yeah, because it's, it's the Germanic spelling O-E, mm. which like Matt Groening and yeah. James ba or John Boehner and people, other people. Yeah. Okay. You know, anyway. So you say your name. Okay. Which is? Andrew Bailey. Now, now my brain is going. Ah! Sorry, I was just like, I was like. 30 episodes, man. <laughs> it's all right. With the English accent, it sounds, it doesn't sound like, an American's like, Bowley, you know? <laughs> and with your accent, it, 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 it sounds almost Bailey-ish, so it's all right. That's why I wasn't going to. Oh, I feel terrible. Don't worry about it. Anyways, so. <laughs> Didn't mean to ruin your day. <laughs> I was going to call you Andy, and it's going to be fine. I think this is Which Andy is fine. Yeah. That's what most people call me, yeah. so. I think this is all staying in the pod because that would be quite funny. Right. <laughs> so here we are back at the fabulous Pima Air and Space Museum. And we're here with Andy, who's the director of collections. I'm not going to try to pronounce his surname. But I've been getting it wrong for years. What we thought it would be good, because we've had Andy in the middle of the pods now for a year, but actually spend some time with him. And we're actually in the collections hangar, essentially. Not looking at aircraft, but we're going to look at the things that go around life with aircraft. So we're just going to have a chat. But start with, how did you get into this game, mate? Because, you know, it's, this is a great gig to have, but you don't just walk into getting to play with all these toys no. and check our pockets when we leave. <laughs> no, no, you don't. Uh, I've just been really lucky. I mean, a lot of it was a lot of hard work, you know, to mm -hmm. get to a point here, to work here. Um, I started interest in this quite young. I was just always fascinated by World War II and aviation and military naval history. And... When I went to college, I decided I wanted to do a history degree, thinking that I was going to teach, and didn't really decide I didn't want to teach, and I had to do a semester abroad, so I did a semester in the UK, and I was at Brunel University, and we got to go in uh, Levin Group headquarters, yeah. and all this stuff, and I kind of got back, and it's like, you know, I want to do something more like this. So went to grad school for museum studies, went to the University of Leicester uh, in the UK, and 
focused on the history side of things, did an internship with the interpretation department at Duxford for a mm -hmm. summer, and did my thesis on interpretation in air and space museums with the cheeky up in the air, you know, interpretations in air and space museums. Mm -hmm. But when I came back, uh, and also before that, I did a lot of volunteering at the National Warplane Museum, which was in Elmira, New York at yep. that point. So I'd go down there on weekends, sometimes sleep in the museum overnight, and just volunteer there doing a lot of curatorial and collections work. And then, yeah, um, came back from England, volunteered again, worked overnights at McDonald's for a year, applied for a whole bunch of jobs, got some interviews, and then had a phone interview with Scott and it was for essentially an archivist collections tech job here, an entry level job uh, with the main focus on the Marauder Archive because we have a collections here that are from repository groups. So things like bomb group associations and stuff like that. But there was a huge collection from Marauder Historical Society focusing on the Martin B-26 Marauder. So that was kind of my focus while working on things. And over the years, I've been lucky enough to be able to promote up within an organization because that often doesn't happen because people will stay in a job yeah. until retirement almost. So I was lucky enough between people moving on to other jobs and stuff, move up to curator and now director of collections and exhibits. Fantastic. And yeah, I, I remember you showing me around here last year and it's, it's a treasure. The, the aircraft are phenomenal, but the bits you've got in the cases are great. But I guess that's what we have to talk about is what goes into the cases right. and then how do you how do you choose? Because right. I look at this and think this is actually more tidy than my wardrobe <laughs> at home. But you know, what are the decisions that go into making an exhibit and telling a story to the public who may have just come in for the aircraft, but you're going to want to tell them a little bit more about it because it's the people that make these things interesting. Right, right. And, and that's one thing that we really wanted to focus here because you go to some air and space museums and they don't have a lot of the smaller artifact support mm -hmm. around it. Um, so, you know, it all kind of starts with, all right, what, what's the topic that we're doing? Yeah. You know, like one of our more recent exhibits we did was an ICBM exhibit. Um, now, obviously, the majority of ICBM artifacts we have in our collection are Titan II, obviously, yep. because of the Titan II Missile Museum. But we had other things. We wanted to tie it into, you know, uh, also the space program. So that kind of focus on which rocket programs we were looking at. So you kind of get into a focus and... That kind of gets you the idea of like what kind of artifacts and what are the stories you want to tell. Because sometimes, you know, it's a very focused kind of thing, like, you know, with ICBMs. But other times, like when we were doing the exhibitry in Hangar 5 for the Pacific War stuff, I mean, we really tried to go all in with the uniforms and all that stuff. Um, you know, acquiring stuff from Allied, for, you know, partners. So, you know, Fleet Air Arm, Royal Air Force, New Zealand Air Force. Um, and then also expanding a bit more into the ground side of things, because in the Pacific, it's a much more combined. Yeah. Not that Europe wasn't, but, you know, when you're 8th Air Force or Strategic Air Force, everyone kind of focuses on that and not on, you know, the more mm -hmm. combined arms aspects of a lot of these other things. So it, it, it kind of goes all over the place. It really kind of depends on how broad of a topic you're doing or how focused. So that's what gets into a lot of the artifact selection. And then also trying to choose things where it's not really repetitive, you know, getting different types of artifacts that look different because... Not, not having 23 different versions of the same thing, even though you might have. Right, yeah. exactly, exactly. Or, you know, you know, 20 blue uniforms, just slightly different and stuff like that, <laughs> um, you know, can not be as interesting as trying to change things up as much. So if we can, if we have known person connection to some of these artifacts, then we can tie that person's, you know, story. Even if it's just like basic, you know, this guy, you know, was a gunner on A-20s in this bomb group in this squadron in New Guinea, you know, in 1944 or 43. So as much as possible, if we have that provenance, that helps us kind of steer on choosing an artifact because then we can bring in the person side of it besides being, hey, this uniform or flight suit was used in this theater on this bomb group or whatever. Super. So it's bringing it back where possible to an actual person yes. and an actual story. Cause, Absolutely. Yeah, I, I suppose that's for all, for all of us here. Yeah. Right. Thank you again, Joe, for being the cameraman. <laughs> um, that's where it gets interesting. It's right. all inanimate until there's a human to tell that story. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, and even when we don't have a story with it, at least, you know, like some of our Hangar 5 stuff. We, at that point, did not have much in the way of British and Commonwealth stuff. So we were acquiring stuff 
<laughs> from dealers or eBay or whatever to put, you know, the complete kit together and stuff like that. So a lot of those don't have a personal story, but you know, you, it still makes it more personal when you see all of that on display, even if it's on a faceless mannequin versus just seeing a big metal airplane. You know, it still ties in. It's like, oh, these guys were doing this and they were wearing that, <laughs> which sometimes it's not what people expect. No, and, and you know, it's as us climbing around in some of these aircraft today in jeans and a hoodie, thinking, right. this is really tight, and then thinking, heated suits, jackets, right. flat jackets, you know, 87 layers of long johns, all, all those sorts of things. That's an aspect that you need to tell because you wouldn't think of it otherwise. Right, and you know, and that comes around into a different thing. You can look at our women in flight exhibit, mm. and you see a lot of these more vintage flights or you know, flight attendant uniforms from the 60s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and you're like, how in God's name did those women walk down the, the aisle of an airplane, possibly carrying food, also maybe having to do medical help on someone in, you know, high heels and, you know, go-go boots and everything else. And very tight uniforms. Yes, <laughs> yes, indeed. That is a fabulous exhibit, and it was fun being out chatting to Lindsay as well, who's, yep, Lindsay who's, Goss, who's, who's in the exhibit, and has, a, has a, that picture in her office as well. Which uh, well, the one of her working on the aircraft? Oh yes, she's got in there. She's she's got as well. So great, great. She's, she's tying it together nicely. And, and and that also circles back in the fact that with a lot of our exhibits, we don't want to just focus on the pilot, yeah. right, or the air crew. And when we did the women in flight exhibit, that was a very intentional choice. Was all right, maintenance personnel, pe engineers. As well, and especially when you're dealing with World War II, like, you know, WAS and the support services in all the countries except really the Soviet Union, you know, most of them were all ground-based supporting mm -hmm. the guys in the air. So it's the same thing even with men and everything else. We don't want it to be just about the air crews, which becomes the focal point in so many exhibits because those are the big names and the hero, you know, people who perceived as heroes and all that kind of stuff, so... Let's have a rummage. All right, well, let's what, do that. And dear listener and viewer, you haven't really prepped him. So what we're going to see is going to be a surprise. For right. All of us. So we're, let, yeah. let's let's get cracking. What what would you like to show us? Well, why don't we just kind of walk through a bit, and we can start since we're back here. We can kind of talk a little bit about our collection as a whole. Again, as the Pima Air and Space Museum, we are not a government military. Museums. So our small artifacts are much like our aircraft. They cover the whole gamut of military, foreign military, civilian, airliners, general aviation, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, you know, we look over here and some of this stuff is really, you know, well cataloged, but a lot of it is a hodgepodge of random things, you know. <laughs> we catalog them, put them on the shelf, and as long as we know on what shelf it is and where it is, then we're able to pull something like, you know, the random clock that someone pulled out of an aircraft and made it into a mantelpiece, or some of the just vintage stuff that we've gotten over the years, sometimes for set dressing and things like that. And then behind Matt and I, we get into our uniform collection, which is huge, <laughs> to be honest. And what's the cool thing is, again, you know, we kind of collect just about everything. A lot of the stuff in these bays here are, again, a hodgepodge of just more current donations that we've gotten over the last few years. Catalog it, tag it, do all that stuff, put it on the shelf, and you'll notice that we have all our bays labeled so people know where they are. But this is what gets into the fun stuff. Yep. Here we are getting into flight attendance uniforms. I, I remember you showing me this time, this one last time, which is why I, I spotted it and wanted to grab it out because yes, I don't think I could get into it, but, <laughs> and no one would want to see me in it. But yeah, dear viewer, this is sixty chic for Brandon. I, you know, this one might actually be. Let's see if it doesn't say on the tag. It could also be Continental, because mm. Continental had a lot of orange and gold colors yep. back in the day. It's a little hard to tell because some of them did keep to colors that kind of were their airline colors, but then those were changing, you know, regularly. regularly. And especially the fact that, like, at that time, fashion trends were being set by the uniforms being worn by flight attendants because you had people like Pucci and a lot of big names who were designing uh, the whole you know, kit for these flight attendants, which was often six or seven different uniforms that they could wear at different times, different flights and stuff like that. 
love the nylon. Yeah. <laughs> but that, the one fun thing about dealing with the flight attendant uniform stuff is the fact that it's not all, you know, blue, brown, or green. So speaking of Pucci, this was a brand F1. We have a, another one of these on display in our Women in Flight with the complete like pill, pillbox hat and all that kind of stuff. This was also the uniform that they also had the big clear kind of fishbowl helmet that oh, they would yeah. sometimes wear with it and it would go over the uh, pillbox hat. It was all just very yeah. 70s, <laughs> it was very 70s, you know, combined with a weird 70s sci-fi element on top of it. Um, but squeezed in here, even though and this is not flight attendant, this here though, is an original WASPs uniform from World War II. So the Women's Air Force Service pilots, for most of the, for most of the time, they were wearing hand-me-downs and oversized men's flight suits and stuff. But they finally got to the point where they had their own uh, uniforms tailored for them. And they were all kind of mostly in the Ike kind of style like this. I'm trying to remember the name of the blue. There was a specific name of the blue for these uniforms which I'll remember after, after we're done filming, as I usually do. But these are just kind of, you know, again, kind of showing the, the wide variety of stuff that we have. You know, we have things like airline pilots' uniforms and all that. Um, you move on and we get into Army, Navy, Marine Corps uniforms, stuff that's related to the aviation side of those branches. Flight jackets, post-war flight jackets, gray coats. Grow bags. Yep. Flight suits. Um, this is cool. We had donated to us a Red Arrows flight suit by the pilot whose name is on our Hawk, Red Arrows Hawk, that's on display in Hangar 1. So the intention is to soon put it out on display in a display case next to the aircraft. And then some of the other fun stuff that we have. We have quite a few party suits from Vietnam. So, you know, painted flight jackets was kind of the big thing for Air Force pilots or Army Air Force's pilots in World War II. During Vietnam, every unit kind of had their own colored party suit. So this is what they would wear going to the clubs, bars, etc. They would often have um, not for prime time patches on them, you know, a lot of the morale patches and stuff like that. <laughs> this one's a little bit basic, but this was a guy who flew B 57s in Vietnam. Uh, sometimes they had scarves and stuff. Um, they st still do something similar for units that deploy to Korea, because that kind of ties in, because we have John Boyd mm -hmm. when he was with uh, was it Asan Dragons yep. at the A 10 unit in the 80s, 80s or 90s, I'm not sure when he went over, but you know they were still doing party suits in the Korea deployments as well. But we have a lot of these, and they're really kind of fun because they're all different kinds of colors and different types of stuff. Um, we also have work overalls from people who worked in factories and stuff, because often, especially in pre-World War II, World War II, often a lot of the times, the, guy, the men and women working in the factories often had overalls that had the corporation logo or corporation name on the back of the aircraft, including, you know, like the plant number, like this one. That's brilliant. Yeah. I just happened to see that. I was like, and, yeah. Yeah. and that's the sort of vintage denim that I can hear friends of mine back in England going, <laughs> Um, yes, the hipsters. What can you do <laughs> All right, so come back over here and we get back more into our uniform collection. So again, more flight suits of all types from like World War II on to more modern ones. Um, you know, we have things like civil civilian air show pilot flight suits. It's a guy who I'm not sure if it was the Bud Light Microjet or if it was a different Bud Light sponsored air show performer. I'd have to take a look at the paperwork and look up the name, but. It's just a really sort of fun, fun aspect to it that 
Bud Light sponsored everything back then, didn't they? They did. <laughs> they, they, they did indeed. Absolutely. But yeah, you know, things like more party suits, uh, an F-16 pilot from my, our local guard unit at TIA. Um, we just, you know, end up with a lot of random stuff through various donations. You know, there was a guy who was on an exchange program. There was an A-10 pilot. And, you know, he swapped flight suits with a guy who flew for the German Navy and another one who flew for the German Air Force. You know, it just keeps going on. <laughs> and I guess this is the thing where you have to be circumspect about what you accept, but also aware that a lot of this can immediately be used in display. Right. So it's, it's a balancing act. It is. It is. Uh, you get to the point, you get, you turn down a lot of stuff. Yeah. Because it becomes repetitive. Mm -hmm. We don't need another singular service dress uniform from World War II. I mean, if someone like Bob Morgan or Chuck Yeager wore it, well, yeah. But when you're talking about another, and that's not to diminish what any of these guys do, but as a museum, you really do have to be careful because if you take too much, you're doing a disservice to what you have because you don't have the room, you don't have yep. the time and the staffing to take care of it. Uh, so we do try to be picky. Uh, the problem comes when you get a lot of people who come in with a, just a really awesome, complete collection of someone's career. You know a lot of that stuff's going to be duplicate, but when you get like uh, the footlocker of everything yeah. showing up, it's kind of hard to say no to that because it's such a complete and awesome collection. But yes, yeah, so many World War II uniforms and stuff that's very much of its time. Yes. Uh, you, we were offered that recently. We decided to go ahead and take it because it's telling. It's a very specific point in time. It is a very specific point in time. And it's something, to be fair, that would be worth talking about too, yep. putting it on display. Because wartime, what do you do? You dehumanize the people that you're fighting. Yeah. And that's where you end up with something where you put money in there and it's a kid's game, essentially. Yeah. So, yeah, you can it's continue it's down all our World War II uniforms, World War I uniforms, just lots and lots of brown and green. Yeah. But, and, and important blue. So here's, there here's is, some of yes, my, yes. Here's I some was of my say. Canadian countrymen down the back. Yeah, and he was, uh, this gentleman was, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he flew Spitfires in the Mediterranean. So, uh, and it was a pretty cool, complete collection with some flight suits and flight helmets oh. and a scrapbook or two. Um, Scott was really jealous that yes. we ended up with it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, it's, it's nice that it's here and not in the scary hat room back at his house. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You're pretty much living amongst all that right now, aren't I you? I am, yes. <laughs> to be fair, he's going to be checking my pockets when I leave as well. <laughs> <laughs> and then a lot of the stuff on the boxes here is lots of different types of flight gear and boxes, things of that nature, binders of patches, both embroidered and leather. Uh, let's turn this one over real quick. Boots, film cans, yep. piles. But boots and boots and boots. And then all of the stuff in most of these this, this shelves is... gets more archival stuff, photographs, documents, stuff that's not so exciting for a camera. But there's some stuff I want to pull and take a look well, at. Well, yeah, it, it's not stuff that's not so exciting for a camera, but I can feel him getting quite geeky. <laughs> <laughs> and same, same for me, because this is as great as the stuff is, right. the data is just wonderful and Absolutely. That's, that's where you start being able to tell really interesting stories when you're doing the, the research so. right right and that's why we keep all the stuff for researchers for the preservation aspect uh, also it comes in handy too if it's someone's military records if we do decide to display stuff you can piece together their whole career if you don't already have that mm -hmm. on hand because that's always one of the things I always try to do. If we get a donation and it's someone who's alive, send me a document, just list what your career was, whether it was airline, flight attendant, whatever. Who'd you work with, when, and stuff, so that you have that information. Mm -hmm. Because, again, as we were talking about, you can display this stuff, but without kind of tying in the human 
the personal story of it, it's not as interesting to the general public. Oh, because yeah. if it's just another flight suit, it's just another flight suit. But if right. it's, this is the person who wore it, and go through, like um, Mike Kusick's stuff, that you, right. you've got in the, the, the Huey case, which right. is fantastic. And Mike's great. Anyway. He is a great yeah. guy. It was such a fascinating story. Oh, yeah. We're going to take a quick break to get the latest from director of collections, Andrew, ba uh, Andrew Bailey from the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'll get it right eventually. Welcome to the Pima Air and Space Museum. Today we're going to talk about one of our most recent restorations, the General Dynamics F-16B Fighting Falcon. The Fighting Falcon was a response to the Air Force looking for a lightweight fighter that was a cheaper alternative to the expense of F-15. It ended up developing from an air superiority fighter into a multi-role aircraft. It was named the Fighting Falcon, but was commonly known as the Viper by its pilots, which came from the popular TV show Battlestar Galactica, which featured the Viper fighter. The B model is a fully combat-capable trainer version of the F-16A. Its only difference between the A model is that it had a shorter range due to less fuel cells because of the second seat. Other than that, it had the same performance and weapons capabilities. Our aircraft was the first F-16B to come off the assembly line. It served in training units at Hill Air Force Base, Luke Air Force Base, and McDill. It then ended up with the Florida Air National Guard, and then spent the last three years serving with the South Carolina Air National Guard, before going into storage at davis Monthan Air Force Base at their AMARC facility. We ended up acquiring the aircraft in 2017, and after a few years of working on it and repainting it, it went out on display just the last couple weeks. To find out what's going on at the Pima Air and Space Museum and to see the incredible collection that they have, please visit www.pimaair.org for more information and be sure to give them a follow via all the links in the description to this episode. And now, back to the show. Uh, so, in all of these, we're really looking at a lot of the same stuff, stuff in boxes, library books, things of that nature. Up here, you get into all our technical orders. We have almost two full carriages of manuals and technical orders. So you get all the very typical military technical order binders that you've been see since the 1950s up until everything went digital, essentially. So we have ones for lots of different aircraft. Some of the stuff comes in handy for our restoration purposes, especially uh, dashboards, the part breakdowns, the erection and maintenance manuals, things like flight manuals and all this other stuff. It's not stuff that we need for internally, but you want to preserve it because if it doesn't get saved, then this stuff may not be around in the future. It's not kind of like where everything's a bit more in the digital age. Well, that's a question I did want to ask you, mm -hmm. is, you know, there is so much paper in archives, right. and we've hit this switch over the last 30 years of heavy levels of digitization, less paper backups. Right. From, with you, with, with your collections and curation hat on, mm -hmm. what does that digital aspect do for you as someone who's looking to preserve history? Because I know it's a big concern for lots of people, right. the amount of data that we're creating that is disappearing as we speak. Right. From, from your perspective as someone who is going to be telling more recent stories as we move forward, does the digital aspect of it concern you or do you have worries? I, I, I do because honestly, I will say we don't have anything in place right now that's really great for preserving digital stuff other than like, oh, he, oh, you gave me a bunch of digital photos or stuff, all right, we'll put it on a folder on the server yeah. that gets backed up every day and also gets backed up into the cloud. Um, I know more museums are getting into proper systems for doing mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Uh, and to be fair, we're not getting a whole lot of digital stuff quite yet. I mean, we are with some of the newer donations. Uh, I think a, a perfect example is Charlotte Jackson, who is in our Women in Flight exhibit. She flew C-130s in Enduring Freedom and uh, uh, Iraqi Freedom. And she gave us lots of digital photos, lots of digital film and all that stuff. So we have a file you know, called Digital Collections where we keep stuff mm -hmm. based on the people. But imagine, the problem is, is if, if they're right, if they're not <laughs> saving this stuff, then it's not moving on. And I think 
much like us, a lot of museums are not really equipped to deal with this kind of stuff. I can only imagine a place like the National Archive, which has to keep all this stuff and is keeping emails and all this stuff. You know, museums are still kind of wired, like we'll print out the email and we'll put it in an archival box with all the other printed emails and you have a physical, you know, copy of it. Copy right? of it. So I am nervous because I think there are organizations that are equipped to deal with this, but a lot of them aren't. And if people aren't keeping the stuff, then where does it go? And, and, and to be fair, that's also very true of the paper trails and stuff, too. I mean, people kept all their letters from World War II. Other people didn't. Yeah. Not to be morbid, but if someone passes away, people keep all these things. You know, People are going to keep emails and all that kind of stuff because it's a connection to someone who has passed. And that way it gets kind of safe for other generations. Because I look at some of our largest archival collections and it's often from people, who, you know, airmen who were KIAs in World War II because the family kept everything after yep. that. Um, so, yep. yeah, it's, it's, it's an odd one because I really don't know the right answer. It okay. is something to be nervous about because I think... A lot of places just aren't going to keep it, and people don't keep stuff. Yeah. You know, they just delete it. Or worse, it goes away because the software that you use to access that stuff yeah. doesn't Format exist. Format changes and things like right. that. Right. Yeah. And, yeah, that immense amount of storage that's going to be needed for this. You know, I'm sitting here wondering how much storage I've got left on my phone. Well, I'm right, and, that, and that's the thing, too. And then you run into the fact that more and more things in being kept on the cloud yeah. things like that, what happens if somehow that all goes away? Yeah. You know, we're learning that the with buying, mo buying digital movies from Apple and all of a sudden they're like, oh, well, we don't have the rights yeah. for that anymore and it disappears off your... Uh... Not that... It, it's more the concerns of the smaller organizations that aren't you know, necessarily having the ability to keep up on that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Right. So, right. what are you going to show? We, we, we've done the philosophical. Let's All look right. at the actual stuff so you let's can't put in the server. Take a move and move this out of the way. Summers. That's the thing around here. It's always a work in progress. We have so much stuff stacked around as we're cataloging stuff. So, this cabinet, we keep a lot of uh, headgear in. Oh, wow. And I wanted to show off some of the fun stuff. So, things like these types of hats during the 1950s. American Air Force units, 50s and early 60s, had a lot of colorful caps that the squadron would wear with different catchphrases, patches, etc. This is a corporate Northrop hat with the flying wing on there. I'm not sure which one it is, if it's, uh, but still. This is pretty cool, and it's not something that you're going to see often because that was a rather short period in Northrop history. But it's the Northrop Orange, which is what they always, you know, their flight suits and their hats and everything always were. Uh, but, yeah, again, it kind of it covers everything. Military, civilian, airline caps, foreign military. And... The, the point you make with the orange, I think, is, is important as well, is we simplistically tend to look back at sort of everything pre-60s as black and white, don't we? Right. And, it, you know, it's, it's not, it's vivid colors. And I've seen, you know, that style of Northrop hat when you look at the old photos of, of the early test flights and things. And, yes, you can see that it's clearly a color. But when you're thinking that, yes, these guys are walking around bright orange, yeah. which is corporate orange yeah it's it's throwing something else and you know like the crazy bright stripes on i'm guessing that's russian Actually, oh, that's I think American. That, is, that is that is it's a very big peak there it is go. i'm so, not sure the specifics behind that if it's some i mean it's obviously a senior officer yeah. but yeah, it's, so, that is almost it is almost so russian it's, looking. Yeah. it's like the church the higher up you go the bigger the hat yes exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah and real quick here Again, these are all cabinets carrying a lot of smaller artifacts, but it gives you an idea of just the sheer amount of stuff that comes in with people's collections and everything. So, just all the medals. Lots of DFCs, air medals, occasional silver star and service crosses and purple hearts. But medals are often the things that everyone keeps, you know along with all their ribbon racks and ID cards. 
No, it doesn't look very well organized, but... You know where it all is. Kind of. <laughs> so, and that's pretty much what you'll see in all these other cabinets, garrison caps, all that kind of stuff. We don't take models as in like home-built models and stuff, but we do take desktop models, mm -hmm. things like the corporate models that companies would be giving out or would be on desks at places like Martin Marietta or Grumman or Boeing. Um, we also, again, I talked about a lot of repository agreements. All of these boxes on the right here are all stuff related to the Martin B-26 Marauder. Mm -hmm. So thousands of photographs, you know, a hundred plus or a couple hundred linear feet of documents. And this is kind of also a song about a recent donation that just came in was all of his foot lockers with everything. Sometimes non-Air Force related stuff or military aviation related stuff. So sometimes you will we'll go through it and we'll return stuff to the family and say, hey, this is clearly something else and stuff. Yeah. But it, it, I, I guess from, from your aspect, when you're going to tell a story from this period, being able to see what the guys had with them right. informs how you tell that story. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it also helps fill in, fill in their background because if they don't have all the paperwork, you look at something like this and you're like, oh, he was assigned at Amarillo Air Force Base mm -hmm. at some point. And you can look at it and figure it out at a specific time because often these are... It's brochures for what you're going to be right. seeing when you're there. Exactly. Yeah. Things like... This is not an official document. Right, right. <laughs> And then you ask, you know, why do we have anthropological type artifacts? So I, I was reached out by a gentleman whose dad was a chaplain with the Army Air Forces at Nadzab Field mm -hmm. in Papua New Guinea. And he ended up going and befriending the local natives and because he had an anthropology degree as well. So he met up with them and got them to like start working together with uh, the, the Army Air Force unit there, and they took them on a ceremonial boar hunt and all that stuff, and that's what a lot of this stuff is. But what's cool is that ties directly into our A-20, because our A-20 was stationed at NADSAB around the same time that that, well, likely the same time that guy was there, because most all ground personnel were in for the duration anyways. Yeah. So it's, it's an interesting kind of tie-in. The local, the local tribe started helping out and working at the base and all that kind of stuff. So you have this really kind of interesting crossover where you're like, well, yes, why not take these artifacts and we can find a way to display them when we start doing some more displays in Hangar 4. That's amazing. And let me see if I can, is it over here? That sounds like my countrymen shooting off again, doesn't it? It, it does, doesn't it? So, I won't take it out of the bag, but this helmet was worn by Gabreski when he commanded an F-100 unit, I think in Okinawa, near the end of his career in the 60s. So we have a flight suit and a flight helmet from his later stages of his Air Force career. Which is a cool thing to have, you know, because oh, yeah. people don't, people think of Gabreski and they think about what he did in World War II, whether it was in the 8th Air Force or being at Pearl Harbor mm -hmm. during the attack. But a lot of people aren't aware that he had a long Air Force career after that, all the and way a into very the... very interesting career in Korea. Yes, yeah. yes. It, well, that too. So that's kind of the cool thing when we can get some artifacts like that that tie into someone that is known more for something else, but we can yeah. use it to tell the rest of the story. So this is the Douglas McClure collection. Oh, sorry, Charles McClure. He was navigator on Ruptured Duck, which was Ted Lawson's B-25 during the Doolittle Raid, the one made famous by 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, both the book and the movie. So a lot of it's a scrapbook put together by his wife because they got married after war and they met, he was injured like pretty much the whole crew was except for the flight engineer. He was at Walter Reed recovering, and I think she was a nurse or something of that nature. So. Their marriage was celebrity news all over World War II, or those time of World War II. But the cool thing in this collection here is, while he was convalescing at Walter Reed Hospital, he received this letter. If you look at the return address. Oh my goodness. 
Major General J.H. Doolittle. Right. So, Commanding General, 12th Air Force at that point. So, he sent him a letter, essentially, from the 12th Air Force, you know, Dear Charlie, and it kind of goes on talking about everything that's happening in the 12th Air Force because a lot of the Doolittle Raiders went on to fly in the 319th and the 17th bomb groups in the Mediterranean, um, which were marauder units. In fact, in this letter, he talks about Davy Jones, who was one of the Doolittle Raiders, who was flying B-26s. I think at that point, he had made it to 319th Group Commander because they've had casualties that bad and he ended up as a POW. So there's a kind of talking about that. He's asking him just how things are going. So a handwritten letter from Jimmy Doolittle. As ever, J.H. Doolittle. <laughs> I'm glad to see that even Jimmy Doolittle would forget things you have to write. <laughs> right, <afterwards>. right, right, <laughs> right. I think about that too when I see that. It's like, God, I wasn't the only one. And this is, you know, pre, yeah. pre whiteout. They were a close-knit bunch. They were afterwards, and yeah, this is wow. This is something special, and that's why that's why so many of them who were not injured or MIA during the Doolittle raid all followed Doolittle, yeah, to the Twelfth Air Force in the Med, um, and a lot of them ended up as POWs in KIA because they were they were flying low level missions too, anti shipping missions, and stuff, and they were taking pretty high casualty rates in those early days with the 319th and 17th bomb groups. All right, let me find this, another this him, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's you know it, it's interesting because we get a lot of this kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden you see something like that and you're like, wow, holy, yeah, yes. Wow is about the only way you can put it. Because it, not just a letter from Jimmy Doolittle, but a letter to the navigator of Ruptured Duck and I watched 30 seconds over Tokyo. I'm just uh, being nosy oh, now, sorry. Yeah, this is, um, the final all, it's, they sent out glasses for the final toast to I think all the surviving family members. Mm -hmm who were invited to the final toast of the, so for those who don't know, a bottle of whiskey, I think it was, mm -hmm. was brought to the, one of the first Doolittle reunions. I believe it actually was here in Tucson. And they made goblets for each of the members of the surviving Doolittle Raiders. And every year they get together, they would turn one over for anyone who'd pass away. And this is all at the Air Force Museum. And then they cracked it open and try and remember who the last surviving Doolittle Raider was. Was he Doolittle's co- I think it was, yeah. His co-pilot. And his, his name's gone straight out of my head. Me too, me too. But, so they did that, they cracked it open, of course, family members, a lot of mm. Air Force officials and everything. Yes. So that's the glass that they were using to drink that final toast. All right. The exciting life <laughs> of museum collections. You just always need to make sure there's not someone else in the aisle that yes. you're closing. Well, you'd hear pretty quick. You, you would. It's you like would. the, yeah, was it in um, Austin Powers? When it's like, get out of the way. And it's, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see, bay two, shelf three. So this was another collection that when it arrived kind of blew our minds. So this gentleman, John Henry Gear, was an Army Air Forces pilot. Now you take a look at this. Pacific War, handwritten diary. Whipple S. Hall Company, Incorporated, Manila, Philippines. This guy was at Clark Field at, the, at December, well, December 8th when the Japanese attacked and it, he kept two because he knew it was in such an important thing that he was going through, kept two diaries where he wrote the same thing pretty much in both of them, all the way from 41 to February 42, because he ended up at Clark. He was flying B-17s and B-18s. Didn't, I don't think he flew on the extra day because we have his original log books as well. And then ended up going on to Mindanao. He was flying P-40s down there and then got evacuated to Australia where he was flying with a B-17 unit out of there in what was a really 
demoralizing time. He talks quite a bit about the morale of the B-17 unit was really, really bad. Back to the old grind of just sitting and waiting. B-17s yeah. and... 24s. 24s expected in Del Monte. The local raids pursuit held up until Borneo is retaken. All quiet. Oh, when Borneo is retaken. retaken. And so, that's, so, that's the 20th of January, 1942. Right, 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 right. <laughs> and it is, it's a lot of that. I mean, he actually, his ship, he was, I think, moving on ship from Clark to uh, Mindanao to Del Monte, and his ship was sunk offshore, and he had to swim, you know, essentially to the beach and all this stuff. It's, it's crazy, and it really is a lot of just waiting, occasionally going up and flying a P-40 now and then, and then getting to the point waiting for a B-24 or an LB-30 or something to pick him up and get him out of the Philippines. And then he went on to fly B-29s, and he kept a whole diary with B-29s in his time on Saipan and a really great uh, scrap album. And he also was smart enough with his, both his log books and these diaries to rewrite them post-war in better handwriting and better. So there's actually triplicates of these diaries in here, not to mention the digital copies that he made. But when you think about that and you're holding something that was written by a guy who was there. at the fall of yeah. the Philippines, it's really kind of a humbling moment. And then when you read what he's going through, both being demoralized but also trying to be upbeat, you know, like mm. when we, you know, when when we, we, re we take Borneo, Borneo yeah. you know. So, but yeah, that's kind of, it's the stuff that we have back here. Gems of artifacts to documents, to letters, diaries, log books, all that kind of stuff. This has been amazing. Thank you for letting us have a rummage. In, no problem. I'm going to say your collection because it is. Really. <laughs> and yeah, this has been great. That is remarkable. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's kind of like I said, when I sometimes find this stuff, I'll post something on my Instagram page and it will be something like, there's diaries and then there are diaries. Yeah. There are log books and then there are log books. There's yeah. a letter and then there's a letter. You know, there, and that is no, you know, as a museum professional, you're supposed to treat everything that it's all equal and everything. But you know when you're seeing something that actually has some historical ramifications, like those diaries is something that anyone writing on that topic it's going to want to go through there and read it because it gives that first person account and also helps clear up at a time that was chaos chaos yeah. right total chaos yeah. mate right. this has been great thanks so this much. is a lot of fun matt i cannot thank andrew bailey enough for his time taking us through the fantastic archive that they have at the pima air and space museum there's a lot more coming from pima and we've got some fantastic stuff we've got interviews with scientists who worked on the Sophia Airborne Telescope, which is an old Pan Am 747SP. We do an amazing thing with a veteran and an A-20 Havoc. That's really good. We visit Goshawk Unlimited, where they are restoring some incredible aircraft and more. You're going to need to like and subscribe to be able to not miss out on anything that we've coming up, plus all the things we've got planned for this year. If you want to know about what we're doing early, and get involved. You too can become a damn castier on Patreon from just £3 a month plus a bit of that. You get all these episodes early. The audio version comes with a different intro and outro, but you get a handwritten card from me. You can get either a Tempest, fantastic, a Hurricane, even better, P47, a Mustang, even a Spitfire, because it always has to have a Spitfire. Regardless of that, like, subscribe, do all that. Check out the Pima Air and Space Museum. They've got some incredible things coming up. I think there's another paper plane contest, which is always great fun. Also 909 Apparel. All those links are in the description below. It's good to be back. Thank you for your patience. And until next time, thanks for watching. Bye-bye. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcasts and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.